Hey, welcome to my special YouTube channel intro to my amazing followers. So I'm going to be recording this and adding it just for you all so you can see me doing the magic behind the show. This episode of Forged by Trust podcast is brought to you by my guest today, Lena Cisco, and her new elicitation course. Elicitation is a vital tool that will teach you about human behavior and conversational mastery. Lena offers an online 12 week program in advanced elicitation where she mentors you every week along the way. You'll be able to influence people to be open and honest and get critical information without ever asking for it. If you wanted to decipher hidden messages and get to the truth, then join my guest, Lena Sisko's advanced elicitation program at thecongruencygroup.com. Coming up next on the Forged by Trust podcast. Join the military? Are you kidding me? I'm like, I know, I don't think I'm, I'm up for that. And he's like, well, if you can't be Indiana Jones, Lena, why not be James Bond? That's all I wanted to do, experience new stuff. And of course, as I got into my career now, it's helping people, helping people be safe from other bad people. It all starts with being genuine, having a smile. You can smile at people. No harm is going to come to it. If they don't smile back, that's on them. It all starts with self-awareness. Welcome to the show. I'm Robin Dreek, and on the Forged by Trust podcast, we decode the interpersonal communication skills of the world's most acclaimed forgers of trust. We unlock the skills and techniques from spies, spy recruiters, master interrogators, globally recognized behavioral experts, C-suite executives, entrepreneurs, acclaimed authors, and thought leaders. Each episode provides specific actions that you can immediately apply to any aspect of your personal or professional life. Today's episode, Manipulation and Our Moral Compass, is with my friend and the master interrogator, Lena Sisko. Lena Sisko is a former naval intelligence officer and Marine Corps certified interrogator who served in the global war on terror, conducting hundreds of interrogations. She's a published author, keynote speaker, former TEDx speaker, and was an expert witness on an Emmy-nominated court TV show for three years. She keynotes around the world and is a speaker for SpyX and the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Since 2003, Lena has been training the Department of Defense, government agencies, law enforcement, special forces, and private sector industries in interviewing and interrogation. Statement analysis, body language, detecting deception, elicitation, and change leadership. Lena is also certified in organizational change management and received her certificate in the psychology of leadership from Cornell University. She has master's from Brown University in archaeology, and her BA is in anthropology from the University of Rhode Island. In 2013, Lena started her own company called The Congruency Group. In today's episode, we talk about Lena's journey from archaeologist to military interrogator, the critical need to be self-aware, manipulation and our moral compass, elicitation techniques, and so much more. And there she is, Lena Cisco, super genius. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So with that, oh <laughs> Lena, welcome to the show. I can't believe I finally got you on the show. You're busy. You just went through a move. Your company, gosh, you got a lot going on. And I'm so I apologize for the me moment for everyone. I am one of like the most fortunate people in the world because I keep getting to talk to amazing people. Every, every time I have a guest on, it's like a masterclass mm -hmm. in, in them. And yeah. if you didn't have yeah. curiosity before you watch a show or before you got into podcasting, you get it now because I become more and more curious because so many people like yourself bring these amazing skills to bear. And it makes me feel like a complete moron, even more so after a show. So thank you for coming and sharing <laughs> your expertise. <laughs> Well, listen, you have an amazing skill too. And that is you connect with people and you make them feel so comfortable that they want to just, you know, give you all this information and spend a lot of time with you. So you also have an amazing skill. You're very kind. You gave me goosebumps. Every time someone gives me goosebumps, it makes me <laughs> feel good because we all suffer our own imposter syndrome to varying degrees, yes, I do. think. And yeah. the one thing that I have found that I love more than anything is make people feel valued. And that's what you do as a master interrogator. And there's so many things that you're phenomenal at. But that brings me to my favorite question to start off with is the backstory. Mm -hmm. The hero's journey to become the most, probably one of the most successful people I know in what you decide to do as an entrepreneur. And it's all 
culminated with all these great skill sets. So how did you become, I call you a master interrogator, which you are, but you so many different skill sets from that. What was that journey? Because that's an unusual journey, I think. You know why it's a hero's journey? Because it just was never planned. I had no intentions of ever taking this path at all. It fell into my lap. It was this, we call it in my leadership training, the blue dot scenario, which is something that happens. It presents itself and you're like, oh, it's scary, but is it scary? But it's adventurous and I'm excited, but I'm also nervous. Should I do it? Should I not? And it's, that's what happened to me. And I took the opportunity to do it. And that was two things in my life. I was a former archaeologist. I loved my profession, loved my career. And I graduated from Brown with a master's and I didn't have a job. And so I had a friend and he's just a you know, local friend that I grew up with. He just joined. I, I got to call time out. I'm sorry. Yeah. The geek in me is coming out. You say archaeologist. I'm thinking Indiana Jones. How would you get into want to be archaeologist? And what was your plan to do with that? <laughs> Indiana Jones. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> great. I, I was in love with Harrison Ford and I was in love with the adventure and traveling to foreign countries and meeting different people. And that it was all about the adventure for me. Curiosity. Yeah. Curiosity. I am seeing this massive theme of individuals like yourself and curiosity. So that's, so you want to be an archeologist because of your curiosity. Where did that come from? Was that part of you growing up from day one or people around you curious? Where does that come from? Do you think? You know, I think it came from my mother's mother, even my mom. She, my mom was an artist and she was a writer, which I think that's where I get my writing from. But I think that curious nature really stems from my grandmother because my mother always said, you're just like my mother, you're just like her. I'm just wanting to, you know, all natural this and that and exploring and into the whatever woo woo stuff. Woo woo stuff. I love, <laughs> so love woo woo stuff. So tell me more about your grandmother then. So what was your grandmother with the woo-woo, all natural, her curiosity? What was this it all about? This is what I remember. My grandma was anti-medication. It was all like natural stuff. So every time you we went to visit her, I will never forget this. It's one of my most memories. It's not fond, but it is a very strong memory. My brother and I would walk into her house, open our mouths, and in would go a spoonful of castor oil. Oh my gosh, I could oh. guess it. Because you see it in all the cartoons. Growing up, you're like Tom and Jerry. They're all making each other take Oh God, it was awful. It was so awful. But that's who she was. She was just organic food, you know, when when organic wasn't a thing or a fad. She was into the homeopathic stuff and all of that. She was very, very intuitive. She could predict things and, you know, got senses of when family members were coming and going and all this other stuff. So my mom well, was like, why do you think that was? Like did, did was that? Do you think, because we're going to talk about this too, is self-awareness and spirituality and calmness, because believe it or not, this is a theme I'm seeing with master spy recruiters and interrogators is this theme, which people generally wouldn't associate with what looks like a hardcore type A on the outside from the job description, but it's extremely humanistic with a lot of curiosity. So where, where was this that she grew up that, what do you think was her inspiration to be this way? Gosh, so she grew up in Connecticut, always born and raised there. And then that side of my family came from Ireland. So immigrants, I think my, my, her mother, my grandmother's mother was an immigrant and literally was seven or eight with her brother. And there's a picture of them coming over on a boat, landing in New York city, two little kids on their own, making that journey. And so wow. that was my grandmother's mother. And, but she just grew up in Connecticut, born and raised in Connecticut. Wow. Yeah. And it made a huge impact on your life. All right. So now I can, I apologize. Now we can get back up to the, up to speed with now that That's I understand fine. the framing. Yeah. So yeah. your grandmother, your mother gave you this kind of sense of adventure and curiosity. So keep going. Yeah. And it just, you know, in high school, I was in love with the social studies. I could not. So my dad's an accountant. Right. Mm -hmm. He and he's the teacher professor, which that comes also from my dad. But I can't add two and two. I can't balance the checks. But I mean, I am just not financially savvy. My dad is. But in high school, I was in accounting classes, like barely getting by. But social studies, anthropology, I was getting A plus. And I didn't even have to work at it. I just loved it. And of course, then Indiana Jones came along and I thought, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to become an archaeologist. And I actually became a legitimate archaeologist. And I worked for two years after I graduated 
um, University of Rhode Island with my bachelor's. Then I worked for two years for the university in the Department of Transportation. And then I went on to Brown to get my master's. And I dug in Italy and Greece and had amazing, amazing adventures. What'd you do? Love the culture. Hmm? What, were, what kind of digs were you on? So my first dig was in Greece, and that was a Roman bath complex. Mm. And it was in Kerkera, Corfu. Uh -huh. And so it was kind of like a, a trilogy of sites. You had the Roman port that had, you'd walk on land. I mean, over decades of time and centuries, it just solidified, you know, but it was once a Roman port. Then they had the bath complex, which I worked on. And then they had a Christian basilica. My next semester, my next summer, I went with another professor and I went to Italy and I dug an Etruscan temple there. In and what Tuscan. time, and what time frames were you researching? Oh, gosh. So I think that the temple was Etruscan and oh, gosh, you're going to I don't know the time frame now. I have to look it up. I'm so bad. I'm a very bad archaeologist <laughs> and Roman bath complex. So that was what? 900. B, I okay. think I, I got to think I got. Yeah, I have all the books on my archaeology books over there. I, can't yeah, have to look. I, I was just curious. I just got done reading Leonardo da Vinci. And so it made me extremely fascinated with Italy and Rome yes, during his time frame, which was 14 into the 1500s, which I didn't even know either, yeah, as I'm a complete moron on history. But I, I love, I absolutely love it because it can give us, as as we've seen with lots of things in life, it gives us all the answers to all the questions we have because we're not the only generation absolutely. to have faced these challenges. Absolutely. So how do we, so how do we yeah. go from archaeology to what you wound up doing? So I, I have discovered the gap. And or the bridge, I should say, and it's that investigative nature. So mm, when I was curiosity, an archaeologist, yep. <laughs> it's curiosity, it's investigative. I'm digging up stuff from the earth. I'm looking at the stratigraphic profile. I'm figuring out what time period, what did this came from, what did they use this for, and it was putting together this puzzle of the way of life when I was an archaeologist. And so now, fast forward, what do I do as an interrogator and interviewer? I'm gathering information, putting it together, putting the pieces of a puzzle together to find out who committed the crime, when the next crime is going to happen or whatever have you. Right. So, you know, after I got into the profession, I thought this, it isn't so different. It's actually very similar. One, I'm digging up artifacts. Another, I'm digging up just information. And I'm still having to use that analytical mind to figure out what it means and what do I do with it. So what sparked the idea to transition from investigating history to investigating incidents with the Navy certified by the Marine Corps, because that's kind of a, that's a leap. Yeah. I, I've, when I was in New York as an FBI agent, I interviewed professors from Brown University and things like that. And I can tell you, they were not very happy talking with people from the government generally. <laughs> so how did that transition happen? <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> And, you know, that's funny you should bring that up because Brown is considered like the most liberal school. My husband calls me a liberal conservative and, and I just, whatever the labels, I don't care. And everyone has a right to their own opinion and beliefs. But back then people are like, you went to Brown and then joined the military. How does that happen? And right. That's my question. <laughs> yeah. So after I graduated from Brown, I was left really jobless because I was supposed to get my PhD and they closed down the department. They lost their funding. So I was kind of like floating around going, what do I do? What do I do? And I had a friend who had just joined the Navy. And I had no idea. And he's like, I know what you can do for money. I was like, what? Tell me, because I need money. <laughs> you can you can join the Navy reserves and you get paid every month. And it was not a lot. <laughs> but right. I thought, join the military? Are you kidding me? I'm like, I know, I don't think I'm, I'm up for that. And he's like, well, if you can't be Indiana Jones, Lena, why not be James Bond? And I thought, oh, well, there's something there. I loved Pierce Bronson. I know people who are around my age really love Roger, Roger Moore. Moore. I'm Pierce See, Bronson. I knew right away. All the way. I know. I don't like, no, I'm Pierce Bronson all the way. My favorite Bond. But I thought, yeah, why not? It's action adventure. I was all about that action and adventure. That's all I wanted to do. Experience new stuff. And of course, as I got into my career now, it's helping people too, right? right. Um, and Nervous. especially helping people be safe from other bad people. But yeah, so he said, well, you could join the reserves. I'm like, well, all right, talk to me about it. what exactly is it? And so he told me a little bit. And then the next month I was raising my hand with a recruiter. 
I don't know why I just did it. I was like, that's six years. What, what do I have to lose? Why not? And so I joined for six years as a reservist and I loved it. And I came in as very old, but very low ranking Navy member as an E3. I think I was 27, 28 at the time. I was an E3 and people- And you like, had a oh. master's. And why did you decide to go enlisted and not officer right off the bat? You know why? I didn't feel I should be an officer. I didn't know anything about the military. And why, and I just didn't feel that I had the right to be an officer without having any military bearing or knowledge or anything. So this is also a very fascinating linkage here. You have curiosity, because we're going to get into soft skills here soon, because you can't do what you do just as an investigator. You have to have soft skills in order to be able to forge these relationships. But you had enough self-awareness to have humility. Yeah, I guess so. Because yeah. to say that you didn't feel worthy or didn't have the experience to really be an officer with a master's degree, mm -hmm. that's very unusual. Yeah. Did you, did you find yourself a little unusual with your outlook back then? The only way I thought it was, I thought it was perfectly normal because that's just who I am. But when right. people started telling me, oh, you got screwed over, you should have been an officer. And I was like, really? Why? I have a master's in archaeology. I'm now <laughs> studying intelligence. They have nothing to do with each other. Why would I have, you know, get this rank? And I have absolutely no military knowledge. I know nothing. And I'm like, no, I, that just doesn't make any sense to me. And I'm so thankful that I went enlisted first. Sure. So thankful. I met awesome people and had great training. And then when I finally got commissioned to an officer, I was like, now I deserve it. Now I'm worthy of this rank and I'm going to keep trying to better myself and become a leader now. I would think I was in four, four years. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt, yes, now it's the right time. Now I can fill the, these shoes and make an impact on other people as well. I couldn't have been an officer. An officer, really, you're jumping into that leadership role. Right. And of course, you've seen your NCOs too, but you're expected to be a leader. How could I lead people in an organization which I knew nothing about? And it just did not align with me. I love that awareness. I really do. What did you, so as enlisted for four years, what did you do? What was your rating? I was an IS, so intelligence specialist. And literally I came in, I didn't even have a uniform. My uniforms didn't get shipped to me yet. And the person who reached out said, well, you can start the basic reserve intelligence training. It was called at that time. So it's called BRIT. And I was in Massachusetts. And so I started and I showed up to drill weekend, just in regular civilian clothes. And they were learning, and I'll never forget this, the sub module. Right. So in intelligence school, you learn everything. You learn all about the platforms, the systems and all this stuff. This is all new to me. I'm like, what? Right. Rockets? M m missiles? <laughs> I'm like, oh, ships. I call it a boat. So they were reviewing Saturday morning. They were reviewing their the classes test on the sub module and nobody did that well. So that's why they were having remedial training and they went through the entire sub module on Saturday morning, Sunday, they were allowed to retake the test. So the instructor came up to me. He's like, listen, I know this is your very first drill weekend. And I know you didn't, you know, you only had one day of this, but if you want to take the test, you can take the test. And I'm like, yeah, why not? I think I caught on. And he's like, <laughs> okay. So I took the test and I passed. I got like an 85 or something. So right. I was like, and he was like, okay, well you're in. And it was like an eight module thing. So it should have taken like a year. And I think it took me eight months. I graduated a little early and then I got assigned to the war college in Newport, Rhode Island. That's awesome. Cause I still lived in Rhode Island at the time. And I was doing war gaming, which I thought, how cool I'm, a, you know, I'm an eighties person. I'm like war, war games, that movie. The Whopper. Playing with the Whopper. Bingo. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to war game. This is as cool as being an archaeologist, right? It's not that cool. I mean, it was all right. right. And I was doing country <laughs> studies. And I'm like, oh, well, this is, this is okay. It's it's cool, but it just doesn't have that flair of the adventure. And then, and I tell the story almost every interview I have, and I'm still friends with this commander, captain, retired captain now, to this day, Bill Maloney. And he's the one who came up to me. He was a commander at that time. I was still an E3. And he said, Seaman Cisco, we have an opportunity. And it's called IPW, Interrogations Pr Prisoner of War. The Marines are going to come over this weekend and they're going to talk to the whole unit because it's this brand new thing where the Marines are actually going to train Navy reservists, not active duty, only reservists. And you have to be XYZ, a couple criteria. 
that's the first time they're allowing females to get trained and first time they're allowing in E3, because normally you had to start, I think it was at E4 and I was only in E3. And we want you to join this. So I was like, oh, you know, sounds great. I listened to the Marines and I was like, oh no, 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 no. Uh, that's not for me. I'm not going to war-torn countries and living in tents and interrogating. So stop you again. Prisoners. Why you? What did he see in you? He saw something. What did he see? Then, what did he see? Type A personality, go-getter, people-oriented. I love people. And I have no problem talking to a stranger. I so tell me what he saw around the workplace then. What did that look like to him? Because yes, you have these things and when you're out socializing, but what do you think he saw in the workplace that sing that allowed him to single you out in his mind where you spiked from the norm of everyone around you? Oh gosh, I'd have to ask him that, but I'm an extrovert. So sure. I'm front of the line. I have no problem speaking my voice. I volunteer for everything. Even if I'm going to fail, I'm like, ah, it, it will be a learning experience. I'm very approachable. And I have no problem talking to whatever rank. What makes you approachable? I'm friendly. Uh, I know people think I may not be, but I'm pretty friendly. <laughs> What's friendliness yeah. look like? Oh, I feel like I'm being interrogated. Robin. No, I'm because I, I, <laughs> one of the one of the things I love about being able to chat with folks like you is, is you are being you. Yeah. And a lot of people want to be like you, but might not have had the same upbringing where their grandmother was a was a sage, <laughs> you know, <a> <laughs> but they still want to be like you. And so there's things you're doing that we can learn at every point in our lives if we understand what it is we're searching for so we can start imbuing them. And so being extroverted, yeah, there's a lot of extroverted people, but a lot of extroverted people are very self-centered and self-focused because they want to talk about me, 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 me. And you hit a few things in there that you're, you're friendly. Well, what made you friendly? Again, you said you're- What makes me friendly? Right. All right. It all starts with being genuine, having a smile. You can smile at people. No harm is going to come to it. If they don't smile back, that's on them. But right. you initiate the smile and make it a genuine smile. Smiles are infectious. I've even been told that so many times. I have an infectious smile. But usually when I smile, people just, they don't unconsciously reciprocate a smile. Right. And so you have that connection immediately. It's open body language. I'm not balled up. I'm not shying away. I'm not nervous. I'm open. When you open up your body language, it's almost saying I'm open to you. Right. I'm open to having a conversation. I'm not guarding myself from you. I trust you. I'm comfortable around you. So when people pick up that vibe off of me, the genuine smile, the openness, the calm demeanor, it's mirror neurons start to happen, right? And so now they start to feel what I feel. And that's calm, confident, happy. And people want to feel those positive emotions. They don't want negative emotions, right. right? If you're around somebody who's, you know, not personable or maybe guarded, it may make you feel like, oh, well, I can't touch that person or they're not, I can't approach them. Maybe I'm a little scared of them. If you're around somebody who's very emotional and has a hot temper, you're walking on eggshells all the time. Like, I don't know how, you know, what to say, because I'm afraid of the feedback I'm going to. So being friendly, I think, comes down to just being open, listening to people, having empathy, being willing to, you know, express yourself and share information. Because if I'm not willing to share information with people, people aren't going to share information with me back. So it's that reciprocal relationship. Sure. You're being transparent and vulnerable. Yeah, exactly. And I love one of my go-to rapport building techniques outside of the, the best one, which I think is finding common ground, but it's using humor. And right. when you use humor appropriately, especially self-deprecating, which my personality, I, I can get it. away with people just like, oh, she's human. You know, she's not, she doesn't, whatever, whatever. I can relax around her. And there's, one more th and there's one more thing you, you highlighted, I think, that people sometimes overlook. Matter of fact, it's probably one of the most common things that I, I've heard people say that they would tell their 20-year-old self. And that was, you seem to be very attuned to what was going on around you. And you were a resource for people. You were helpful. You were trying to make other people's jobs easier. And so when you're a gift-giving of that, 
And it's not a tangible gift. It's a gift of how are you making people's lives better and easier around you? Who wouldn't want to reciprocate that by putting you up for promotion, by putting you in, in for programs that match this, this natural tendency to be extremely approachable, likable, all the things you need to be a master interrogator. <laughs> You go. And I loved how you said that. I probably didn't say it as eloquently, but it is that it's that gift that you give people. Mm -hmm. And when, and I have a great friend, her name is Allie. She's amazing. And she has this quote that she puts all the time on Instagram is if, you know, I raise you up, you raise me up and we raise the world up or, and I, it's not the exact words, but I just love that because that's exactly what happens. If I can make you feel good, you make me feel good. We can make other people feel good. And it's just kind of this wave of gratitude, attitude of gratitude. Which is really fascinating to me also, because that is the epitome of servant leadership. And, yeah. and you were naturally born being a servant leader because you're modeling the way of the behavior of all those around you without a title and position. And yet you found yourself yeah. with, and you balance that dichotomy with humility. So you had the competence of the interpersonal skills, but you had the humility to balance it saying, Hey, it's not about me. It's about others. I mean, you, you had, you had the golden recipe for being successful with what you're doing. So, so then the journey continues, you go off to the Marine Corps mm -hmm. school because the Marine Corps are probably the Marine Corps was probably pretty scary. These guys, I tell you, Marines are just intense, whatever they do, they're just nuts. Being one, I can tell you they're nuts. <laughs> You're married Being to one, married I know. To so one, nuts. I can also tell you the same thing. <laughs> so what was that um, like? Oh gosh, it was crazy. I couldn't eat. I was so nervous. Every time I showed up for training, I'm like, oh, what are they gonna do to me this month? Oh my God, I'm gonna fit every reserve drill weekend. I thought this was my last weekend, I'm gonna fail out. That's how intense the training was. Yeah. Even the PT. Like I could barely keep up, but you know, they conditioned me and finally I could hang, <laughs> but yeah. And it wasn't until six, cause it was because I was a reservist. It was a year long program. Wow. Normally it was like a well, one month way back right. in the day. And they've revised that school. It's three months now and it's a little different, but it was a year long program. So it's a one weekend a month. And then we accumulated with an exercise for two weeks. And it wasn't until like six or seven months in where I thought, Oh my gosh, I love this. I love it. And you know, I'm not going to fail out. I think I'm pretty good at it. And I just started really. What'd yeah. you love? What was the thing you loved the most? I loved, I mean, I was with role players in training, but I loved the point where I got either combative role player or one who was lying to me to just give me everything to say, you know what? You got it. Here's the truth. And it was that pivotal point thinking, what was the, the secret ingredient to make this person want to cooperate with me, to make right. this person like me and trust me. And every time uh, we call it breaking, right? Every time a role player and in real life detainees broke from me and told me the truth, it was like <sighs> success, you know, finally. And, and not for a selfish reason, like, hey, I got one over on you, I won. It was because now I get information that other people are going to use. And this is what's going to right. save lives on the battlefield. Right. right? I don't service, need to be, I don't need to be thanked. Yeah. I don't need to be thanked. I don't need to be whatever. It's yay. I got the information. And when I didn't, there was a rough night's sleep. So, you know, I think I'm jumping ahead a bit, but when I was in Gitmo, I started really thinking I have to pin down this recipe of success. What the heck is it? I, I know what it. it is. It's rapport, yep. right? I know what it is. It's human to human interaction and it's rapport. And we have a saying, you attract more bees with honey than vinegar. But I'm like, but it, there's more, there's layers to this. And so I started working out my own interviewing methodology when I was there and I would practice. It was all strategic based, meaning I'm not just focused on getting that. Yeah, I did it. I'm beyond that. I did it. And this is how I did it. And this is why I did it. And this is who's going to do it next because I'm here strategic focus, right? Getting right. more and more information, answering more questions, rapport-based and non-accusatory. And while I was down there and then years after, I was still playing around of the layers that I think was this amazing recipe to get people to like me enough, trust me enough 
to cooperate with me, to give me truthful information. And so, you know, fast forward to today is one of my big courses that I teach law enforcement, both state and federal, is my strategic law enforcement interviewing course. And that's exactly what it is. And I have a lot of my students, students, cops, you know, detectives, U.S. Marshals, after the course say, first of all, it was the best training. We loved it because it's applicable. And then months after, they'll say, this is what happened. I used X and this is what I got. If I don't have my participants coming to me saying it worked and this is what I use, then I'm failing as an instructor or my methods failing, right? So I'm constantly seeking the feedback, but when I get it, I'm like, okay, this is the ingredient. This is, this is the recipe of everything that goes on with human behavior that I have to know of. What makes your recipe unique, you think? It all starts with self-awareness. Ooh, tell me and about that. It, Oh my gosh, it's every keynote I give, every class I give, every lecture I give starts with self-awareness. You have to know you. You have to know your personality profile. You have to know how you prefer to make decisions. You have to know your change style preference. You have to know your communication style. You have to know your biases. You have to know how you come across verbally and non-verbally. You have to know your thought distortions, which are huge. Probably every argument is related back to one of 11 thought distortions. When you know all of that, now you can start to get to profile, even though that word has negative connotations or assess you know, the person you're sitting across from, what are their communication style preferences and so on and so on. Now is the dance, I call it, because I may have to tweak how I come across in order to make this other person feel comfortable. So the easiest example I can give, I'm a super extrovert. I'm loud, I talk, I'm using my hands, I'm all over the place, right? Well, I'm a little too much for some introverts. So I quiet down, slow the rate of my speech, listen more than I talk. And all of a sudden people start to relax around me. So So, it's becoming that self-aware to become situationally aware. Is your main goal in those situations to provide psychological comfort to the other person? So the main, well, it depends. The main goal, if I'm in an interrogation or interview is to get the truth, is to get this person to tell me the truth. Now there's, I got to reverse engineer that to a bunch of steps before. And it's everything from elicitation to questioning techniques to rapport to detecting deception, being self-aware, being situationally aware, knowing the topics I have to question on, the million things that happen. But if that's my end goal, it's all gonna start with getting that person to trust and like me first. Right. That's the first thing I have to do. If someone doesn't wanna give you the truth, they're not going to. Right. So your ultimate goal is to get them to want to give you the truth. How do you do that? You find out their needs and motivations, you build that rapport, build a connection, and then you'll get them to want to tell you the truth. What do you think some of the greatest challenges people have with the self-awareness factor, which is, it seems, it sounds like it's the, the anchor that makes everything work. Yes, it is. In my opinion, is that sometimes we're, none of us are perfect, but sometimes who we are and what we think and how we speak and all that could be better. And admitting that to yourself is pretty hard to do. I had an epiphany years ago where I had a really good friend. I write about her in my first book and she delivered the message that I needed to hear. And it changed my world. Hmm? What'd she say? You want to hear? I do. (laughs) (laughs) So because I am an extrovert, I'm a thinker and a feeler. I'm ENTJ with Myers-Briggs. So am I. Um, being a thinker, I make decisions, fact-based analysis, No, you know, little regard for people, facts and, and all that kind of right. data comes first. Right. And being a judger, super highly organized. Right. I'm not that flexible in scheduling. I like a very tight schedule. I have checklists. I do checklists for everything and I love checking things off as I complete them. But I was running an interrogation school, a town weight certification school for the Defense Intelligence Agency. And it's a, a pretty intense school. It's 10 weeks, a lot of role players, a lot of stuff involved. I was the project manager. And in the middle of this one, right before our final exercise, which is 24 seven ops, they put they started another course. And I was already lack instructors, already my instructor cadre was exhausted. And so I became super stressed. When I get super stressed, most people, we really anchor into our personality preference and we become kind of hardcore. So I became a hardcore thinker and judger, very highly organized because I got super stressed. 
So right. if anybody tried to change a schedule, I was like, no, right. We were down to the minute, became a thinker. My decisions were based solely on fact, objective. That's it. And people would come to me and be like, or, you know, a student will say, well, I can't do X because of blah, blah, blah. And I was like, if you can't do X in this classroom, then you can't do it out in the field and you don't belong in this course. And I was, and that's how I would say it. Right. I was that nice. I was deaf and I had no empathy. Right. And so the student came to me and some feedback after the course was over and delivered me a hard pill to swallow, as I say. And she said, listen, class didn't like you. Thought you were mean, insensitive. And I'm like, what? And that you didn't care about them. And that's the thing that was like, right? Because in my mind, that was the one thing I did care about. I didn't care about anything else. All I cared about was training them to be the best of the best and, and, and be safe going forward. But that message did not come across to them because of how I communicated, because of how I came across. And at that point, I went, oh, my gosh, what am I missing? Right. I really have to get in tuned with me. And even though I'm stressed, I cannot speak in that directive style and I cannot say things the way I am. I've got to be more empathetic. And that's where it started my new journey of really doing some deep soul searching. And if I truly wanted to perfect human connections, I needed to work on me. And so I think that's the hardest thing when it comes to self-awareness is, is identifying what we have to work on ourselves because we're not perfect. What'd you work on? Empathy, 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 <laughs> which is weird because naturally I think I've had it all my life, but right. for some reason- my profession at that time trumped that. Right. And I think it made me feel like I had to be this more dictator, you know, directive communicator. And I think I had this false perception that empathy was being weak. And it's right. not. Right. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Back in the day, also at that point, I also found it difficult to admit if I couldn't do something. Right. Right. Now, fast forward today, I'll tell you everything I can't do. I will tell you everything right. I am not I am not your person for. <laughs> like, go to this expert. It's not me. Right. And they have no problem, right? Or if somebody comes to me for help, I'm like, you don't want me to help you in this. So having that humility, which you said before, and just becoming self-aware. And when people want to give you feedback on some things that could help you become better, better communicator, better partner, better in a relationship, listen to the feedback because it may be that one message that you need to really perfect something in your life. I'm glad you listened <laughs> because you you were able to share even more with so many more people. And that brings us, I'm, we called this episode manipulation in our moral compass because you you said we need to manipulate sometimes. In, yeah. to get the information we need to service the why, which is protect the national security of the United States and, and our friends and allies. So how do you put that together with your moral compass? I'm going to tell you, because manipulation and moral compass are opposite ends of the extreme. They do not go together. Okay? Right. They're contradictory. Persuasion and influencing. Now that's in line with my moral compass. My moral compass is, and we all have one, right? You know right from wrong. And I think there's like someone said at the age of seven, there's an age of reasoning or something, you know, right from wrong. Every human does of sound mind. And so when you're put in a circumstance that challenges you to say, hey, you know, the tension is high. The scenario is dangerous. Are you going to do something that may go against that moral compass? You know, you shouldn't do it. You know, it's not right. Are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? When you're in line with the moral compass, you never do that. You never cross that line. No right. matter what the circumstances are, you don't cross that line. You find another way around it. And, you know, that comes with a lot of interrogation training. And people always bring up the torture and how we tortured at Gitmo. And, you know, I, I was there at Gitmo. We didn't torture detainees at Gitmo. I don't know what CIA did, but I can tell you what military intelligence did and didn't do. Right. And again, it violates our moral compass. Right. Right. And it's ineffective, but. That's a whole nother discussion. I'm so when you totally get with you on it, it does not oh, reward gosh. the brain at all. <laughs> no, I just, mm, yeah, that's, I just go on and on and on about that. And so that's why, again, I came up with my interviewing methodology back there, which is rapport based on accusatory is right. dealing with humans always in line. Everything I did, I said, I heard, I witnessed always in line with my moral compass. But when I got into interrogation, my goal was to get this person to tell me the truth. I had to persuade them to do that. I had to influence them. And I teach persuasion tactics. I also teach, which is like becoming a team, right? That's one persuasion tactics. Like you and me, Robin, we're on the same side. We are right. a team. 
team. We're going to work together. That's one. But you also, you can't be effective in persuading people to be honest unless you know their needs and motivations. So you've got to take a step back further than that. Yes, I have to build rapport. Yes, I have to get you to trust me and like me. But I have to find out what is going to motivate you to tell me the truth. What's going to motivate you to want to trust me enough to open up? And then what do you need in return? Do you need a different cell? Do you need to talk to a family member? Do you need whatever, certain food item, you know, something, but motivations and needs. And so I think when it comes to moral compass is persuasion and influencing, not manipulation. I'm not on board with that. Absolutely. And, and so you put all these things together and I know you have a couple of recent things that are great tools for others. And the first one being your new elicitation course. Want to yeah. tell me a little bit about that? Because it is probably hands down the most sought after information in anything I do because everyone is fascinated by elicitation. So why don't you share a little bit about that course you have? Well, first they should be because it's <laughs> very... It's a very an elite skill. It's an elite human yes. intelligence skill. You would not know it unless you have a human intelligence background or, you know, FBI or behavioral profiling. You don't know elicitation. And we bring it, myself, I bring it to the private sector. It's the most brilliant way to get information from people because it is unassuming, naturally non-accusatory. It is rapport building. And it's just the best method because people are unaware of what your intentions truly are. All right. So to define it simply, it's techniques to get information without ever asking a question. I can have an entire conversation with you for hours, never ask you a question and get a ton of information. Yep. In fact, people tend to drop their guard and open up more because you're not asking them questions yep. and they think, oh, this is just this normal conversation. I do a lot of sales training now, very elite sales force. I go and I train them in elicitation just to bump up their close rates. And they do. It's just amazing because there's so many facets to it. But elicitation itself, I teach 15 techniques all in the form of provocative statements. And I love provocative statements. They're so powerful. (laughs) I know. And and based on human psychology. Oh gosh. So, well, all right. Quid pro quo is probably one of the easiest ones, right? If I need to find out your name, all I have to do is offer up mine. You give me yours. Right. If I wanted to find out your favorite hobby, I just talk about my favorite hobby. You give me yours. If I wanted to find out your most embarrassing moment, I talk about mine. You usually will give me yours. Right? It's that right. reciprocal nature. It's just amazing. My students use it in their careers. I have real estate professionals, CEOs, other C-suite. I have sales. I have investigators. You name them. Entrepreneurs who come and they use solicitation for many different reasons, networking, more clients, boost their sales, whatever it is, find out the truth. And it's just brilliant, but it's a whole new way of speaking and it's not that easy. So my three month course, you're with me one-on-one. Wow. We're in a class. Yeah. That's it really looks- good. That's a really intense, but really good. That's a lot. That's really good. I'm sorry. I'm dumbfounded by that. You give, you put a lot into that. Keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh yeah. So it's every week you and I are in one-on-one office and then we come together as a group, whoever is inside that three month training cycle, we come together in a tag up call. Brilliant, brilliant conversations. People will be in week two, week nine. You know, it's all different. People meet each other. They're connecting. I have students in Denmark, Australia, Germany, here in the United States, like all over. And so already you have that networking going on, sharing stories. We also help each other out. So in the tag up calls, people come and say, yeah, I, I have this you know, this really important conversation with a potential new client. And I was thinking of doing this. What do you guys think? We give each other feedback. And then of course, each week you have tons of info that you get through. You have homework assignments. I check in with you on that. By the end of three months, if I have not made you into a master elicitation expert, then I have failed. It's that powerful. And when you join up for the three months for a year, you have the opportunity to stay in the tag ups. So right. every week you're still thinking about it, rehearsing it and practice, practicing it. The year it's of a muscle memory day. is powerful. Yes. That is perfect. Wow. That is, I can't believe how much energy you have for that. That is huge. What a, what a <laughs> gift you are. <laughs> and, and then also you have a book coming out as well. I want to hear about that a little bit more too. I was super excited about this book because I truly feel that it's some of my best writing, but I also had the most amazing editor. So Lou was just 
phenomenal. It's called Honest Answers. And it's all about, again, getting people to trust you and like you and be honest and open with you. There is a chapter on elicitation in that book. So I go through and I think I talk about, I break them down. So if I have like a day, I'll do the easy eight. Sometimes I'll do 10. If people want to dig down, maybe I'll do four or five, but there's 15 all together. And I think I talk about what I call the easy eight in that book, but it's all about interviewing skills, rapport building, discovering needs, motivations, what I talked about, the elicitation and negotiation. And there's a special, special chapter on negotiation. I have had, you know, hundreds of interviews and interrogations, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in different law enforcement, criminal terrorists, even with clients when I do requirements analysis for organizational change management stuff. And in every interview, my goal is to get as much truth, loyal information that I can with negotiation. This is every single conversation. I'm negotiating to get what I want, right? Yeah. And so in that chapter, I've created what I call the bond negotiation technique. And I <laughs> yeah, also, I right, you know why. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I like bond. I have to I have to come up with an acronym because I'm former military, but I, James Bond. Yeah, I have a James um, bond right? And I use all my knowledge about human behavior and profiling with the personality preferences that I just developed eight NPTs, and I call them negotiation partner types. Wow. So using three dichotomies, I come up with eight of them. And usually you're nego- the person you're negotiating with is going to fall into one of those eight. And I tell you how to handle them, how to communicate with them, what to do, what not to do with your body language, because it will be the best approach for that type of person. Right. And this comes out in November, you said? November. Yes. It was supposed to be May, but there's paper shortages and then oh it was my gosh. they can't print the book. Is that enough paper? Well, that's right. Because it'll be even better. The, the hype will even be more important by it. So that's <laughs> awesome. So if people are listening to this, they're inspired to do more and make these better connections. What's like, besides smiling, you hit that right from the get go and being likable to start with that. What's maybe like maybe one, two, maybe three more things people could start doing today to start building and forging that rapport to start moving forward in different aspects of their lives. First or be second show interest. Like have genuine interest in people. People are super interesting, right? Right, And and when you express interest, you can do that by asking a good open-ended question or tell me about, I'd love to learn how you did. I'd love your story, you know? And just when you, and so that's number one, but number two, this may may even be more critical because if you can't do number two, the number one's just going to cancel. You have to listen. A lot of times we are, when we meet new people, we're, we get a little nervous. We're like, oh, what do I say? And we have this little voice going, I'm going to say this next. I'm going to say that next. Maybe I can do that. Just stop that voice. Let it just take a rest. And then you can actually listen to the person speaking. And then after they're done, now think, okay, what do I want to say? And where do I want to take the conversation? But while the other person is speaking, listen to them, actively listening to them. People know when you're not paying attention to them. Right. And when you, and when they get that feeling you are, it makes them feel really good. Demonstrate that value. Absolutely. Lena, what didn't I ask you that you wanted to make sure you shared with the audience? I don't know. You had great questions. Let me tell you, like <laughs> questions that made me have to think. And I love that. I, I, that makes my brain keep working. And finally, you have all these great resources and everything will obviously be in the show notes. So where yeah. can people go to find out more about Lena? Sure. So my company website, you'll get everything and links to everywhere. And that's the congruency group.com. Yep. And you can also draw, join a private Facebook group that I host called TCG for the congruency group. Right. Tribe on Facebook. I have to approve you in, but we have a great community there and it keeps growing and we talk all things human behavior. And my co-host Gavin Stone and I, we go live every other Thursday night and he's British. So I'm saying fortnight. Right. So every fortnight we go live and we, we educate everybody. We have open conversations. We really truly have a big family starting. So if you're interested in anything to do with leadership and human behavior, interrogation, detecting deception, elicitation. So if you have an interest, join that Facebook group and tune into us. So we like to share information. So, yeah. And of course, if you're interested in my online courses, you can go to tcg.thinkific.com. 
Yeah, definitely check those out. I've I've been crawling all over your website. The the resources are phenomenal. Lena, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your expertise and masterful skills with the world and being so open and accommodating and being likable. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so until next time, folks, we'll see you later. All right. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Forged by Trust. If you enjoyed the show, took away a few new tools, I hope you will leave a great review of the show to show your support. If you're interested in more information about how to forge your own trust building strategies, please visit my website at www.peopleformula.com. You can also reach out to me on any of my social media sites included in the show notes. I'm looking forward to sharing my next Forge by Trust episode with you next week when we chat with Gavin Stone about the myths and truths of lie detection.